This is Make It Plain. Make It Plain. M I P. With Masamela Mafumo. Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get woke. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the midst of the annual observance of Roe obviously demonstrations in Washington, and we know where things stand in terms of the most recent Supreme Court ruling, um, the leak of which they couldn't find the leaker, but that's a whole another thing. We have to wonder about that. Uh, my guest is eminently qualified to talk about this subject. She's professor of history and of gender, sexuality, and women's studies at the University of Vermont, author of The Battle for Welfare Rights, Politics and Poverty in Modern America, the co-author, along with Gwendolyn Mink, of Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform in Feminist Perspective. She's a former board member of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England and current board president of the Planned Parenthood of Vermont Action Fund. Her latest book, and it's an important one, can't wait to share it with you, A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. Felicia Cornblue, ladies and gentlemen, how are you? Good, glad to have you on board. I'm doing just fine, Reverend. Uh, It's a pleasure. Uh, Congratulations on the book. Thank you so much. Um, Does the the, the timing of some of these new developments, I'm, I'm sure you didn't just start working on the book, but it is a timely release. Well, I started working on the book in 2017 uh, when my mother died. And uh, it, my mother died just a few days before Donald Trump's inauguration. And she was, a, she was a lifelong feminist, a lawyer who had kind of fought her way through law school, one of four women in her, in her law school class. Um, I think the hardest phone call I ever had to make was the night that Hillary Clinton lost. And Donald Trump won. And uh, she and I both knew that that's what was happening, right, even before the election was called. And um, and we just cried a little together, you know. So um, I, I found out about the role that my mom played in the abortion rights movement just just after she died. And that was what really set me um, doing this project. And I knew something was going to happen. You know, I didn't know it was going to be exactly Dobbs. I certainly didn't anticipate the leak. Um, I didn't know Justice Ginsburg was going to pass away when she did. You know, those things were were a surprise to me like they were to everyone. But I had been watching what was going on with this issue for many years. And I knew that there were a lot of people in America, women and other people who can get pregnant, right, who are already experiencing a lack of reproductive rights. So all of that kind of went into working on this book. Yeah, Roe was definitely not being enforced in in many places. So talk to us about your mom. She was in New York. She was an activist. Tell us about her role in getting Roe established. Yeah, the story is, uh, it's, it's a New York story. It's about how uh, abortion went from being crime to not being a crime, how people changed the law although not in the way we usually think of it. Um, and it's really, it's really the story of how Roe came to be. It's really a national story, even though it starts in New York. So my mom was a member of the National Organization for Women. They had an abortion committee. Um, and New York Now, in those days, New York Now was, was a very diverse, interesting organization. It was kind of the only game in town for people who are interested in women's civil rights. So it was my mother who was a, a white, Jewish lawyer who had come from a working class background, but it was also people like Flo Kennedy, who was a radical black feminist uh, and a lawyer and who was there in that New York, same New York chapter. And um, they had an initiative to repeal all the restrictions on abortion. So it wouldn't be in a doctor's hands and it wouldn't be in the state's hands, the government's hands. It would simply be in the hands of the person who wanted to have the procedure, you know, in consultation with their family and their doctor and whoever. Um, And my mother, because she was the lawyer on the committee, she was the one who actually turned that demand into official legal language. And the now committee gave it to a couple of legislators who 
book had agreed, they were sort of lobbied and pressured by the activists on the outside, and they agreed to introduce this bill into the New York State Legislature. And, and they did that. I, it was introduced in January of 1969, and it was the first time any uh, governing body in the United States had ever considered the notion, not only that abortion could be you know, decriminalized and reformed, but that it could be simply taken out of the law books entirely, so that it simply would be people's own choice, right? And that was a galvanizing idea for the movement, for the, for the still rising productive rights movement. And that, that, that's where NARAL comes from, that it, it formed around that cause, the idea of repealing all the con- controls, all the restrictions. Um, and it became a mass movement. People went to the streets. And in New York, they won. Um, by April 1970, they got a somewhat less dramatic, but still pretty dramatic change in the abortion laws. And New York became the most liberal jurisdiction in the country. And that really set the stage for Roe versus Wade, which came in 1973. And this, as you alluded to, is is about the movement, really. This was a, a movement that got this done, right? It wasn't just backroom dealing with politicians. The, there were people organizing it in the streets, weren't they? Absolutely. Without the movement, I think there would be nothing. You know, there were there were people who were out front. Uh, people like Percy Sutton, who was an assemblyman from Harlem, who was the first one to introduce a kind of moderate abortion reform bill in 1965. And then there were some other liberals who were working kind of the way AOC and people like that work today to pull the Democratic Party to the left, you know, to make the Democratic Party really honest to its traditions and its history. Right. There was a movement like that. So it was inside the the party and inside the legislative councils a little bit. But really, the energy was all coming from the outside, from this very, very diverse, interesting, multi-part movement that was committed for for different people's different reasons, was committed to making abortion no longer a crime and no longer something that people had to do kind of in the shadows um, with shady practitioners and dangerous practitioners and that kind of thing to make it safe and legal and hopefully affordable for people. Was your mom and those was was your mom and those in the movement able to bring some of the people in Albany along willingly or or did they have to be pressured some? They did both. Um, some people came willingly, some not so willingly. I mean, the thing about politicians, for good or or bad, good and bad, I think I would say, is that they are subject to pressure. That's what a democratic system is, right? People, if you're a politician, you want to stay in office. That's your job, to stay in office, to get elected. And so if you can mobilize, as they did, mobilize at the state level, they lobbied, in, in Albany, the state capital, mobilized at the local level. They, they organized in people's home districts and had protests and quieter petition campaigns, you know, which were sort of suggesting that they might run somebody against them in a primary, you know, somebody who was more liberal on this issue, right? You know, they, they, they used a variety of tactics and they also could be super confrontational. You know, they went to legislative hearings when they thought that the hearings were completely unresponsive to people's demands and they shouted down some of the witnesses. Um, There was one famous hearing in New York where um, the only woman who was invited to testify was a nun. And, you know, not only did that indicate that she had a certain kind of conservative Catholic politics, but also that she was not somebody who was sexually active and not somebody who really resonated with this issue, right? And there were feminist activists who were infuriated by that. And they said, you know, this is an illegitimate hearing. And they screamed and yelled until the hearing basically was shut down. And they did the same thing with doctors who were providing abortions, who were being brought up on criminal charges. You know, they invaded the hearing room and said, this is unacceptable. This is not a crime. This is not appropriate for this to be a crime. So they used every tactic, I, I think I would say, everything in the book. And that's what it took. And so the New York law ultimately would inspire the Roe decision, correct? It did. And some of this might be known to 
people who, you know, who really study this stuff in the weeds. But a lot of what I found out was really unique. So, of course, of course, um, given that New York ultimately decriminalized abortion and New York is such an important state, um, it was even more important in those days, you know, big population relative to other states. Um, that in itself set a precedent, right? And because the New York Times and other major publishing venues are in New York, that had to have had an effect. But I also found that there were really particular ways in which it had an effect. Like one of the things about Roe versus Wade is that it relies a lot on doctors. And Justice Blackman, who wrote the opinion, had um, had been the counsel uh, for the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And he really liked doctors and he took medical authority really seriously. Well, it turns out that that the doctors, the American Medical Association and also the American Public Health Association, changed their abortion policy very, very quickly and just on the eve of Roe versus Wade. And if you kind of scroll back behind that change in their policy, that that change was also because of what happened in New York. It was because of this New York movement. Um, they actually petitioned and demonstrated at the American Medical Association convention. And they, they, they pushed the doctors to introduce a resolution that would change the AMA policy. So none of that was an accident, right? And, and, and once those policies did change, well, then we see the change policy showing up in the footnotes of Roe versus Wade. And that becomes one of the main sources of authority for this landmark change in constitutional law, right? But it was because of what the grassroots folks were able to get done. So your mom was a hellraiser. I would say that, yes. A hellraiser who used to wear, you know, skirt suits and pantyhose and the fat kind of things that women lawyers did in that state. Yeah, yeah. And 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 getting it done. That's a good thing. Now now you were you know you had your mom, but you had a neighbor as well who made a big difference. You were just surrounded by these revolutionary women. I was. And this is somebody who I think everybody in America should know about. Uh, our next door neighbor for most of the 1980s was a Puerto Rican doctor named Helen Rodriguez Trias. And Helen Rodriguez Trias was, she was a, a pioneering woman doctor whose life was both uh, in Puerto Rico, in San Juan, and in New York City. She, she grew up in both and she had a professional career in both places also. and. In the 1970s, she became an activist for abortion rights first, but then once the abortion rights movement was successful and they decriminalized first in New York and then nationally with Roe versus Wade, she started to conclude with, with other women of color, especially, and white socialist women, she started to conclude that Roe was not enough, right? That abortion rights were not enough. And she was she was called into that phase of the movement in part by a scandal that came right after Roe versus Wade. Um, and it was the scandal over the Ralph sisters, these two little girls in Alabama, um, 12 years old and 14 years old, if you can believe it, who had been sterilized, um, meaning they could never have children um, without their parents' consent. Um, their mother signed a consent form, but she was not illiterate woman and she signed with an X and she, um, she told everyone that, um, they had, they had misrepresented what was happening to her kids. They didn't tell her the truth about this procedure that her kids were going to go through. So it was this moment where for people who were really paying attention and who, you know, who, who got that this was also a matter of reproductive rights, they saw the limitations of uh, abortion access and Roe versus Wade in particular as a way to guarantee people's rights, you know, and they saw that if, if people could still be sterilized, if these little kids could be sterilized, right, without their folks' consent, then, you know, what kind of reproductive rights were those, right? They started asking those really troubling questions, and they built on that insight in the 1970s, and they worked very, very hard, first to control sterilization abuse as they understood it, and then from there, they grew. Um, kind of a new approach to reproductive rights, you know, saying that we need, we need everything, like not just access to abortion and contraception. That's great. But we also need the ability to, 
to be free from sterilization abuse, right? This kind of sterilization abuse and all the other things that people might need to be able to have children, you know, not just to not have children when they don't want to have children, but also to have children, to be able to make that choice really freely. That's what reproductive rights mean. Start the new year in a new ride from the Norm Reeves Superstore. Right now is the best time to get the super prices you deserve. Shop our super selection of vehicles at 11 convenient locations. From West Covina to the Cerritos Auto Square, Huntington Beach to the Irvine Auto Center, Vista and San Diego. You're never far from a Norm Reeves Superstore. Shop America's most popular brands. Ford, Lincoln, Hyundai, Genesis, Volkswagen, Toyota, and Honda. We have all your favorite new models in stock for the new year. Looking to trade? We want to buy your vehicle. Any make, any model, any year. Plus, enjoy total peace of mind with your purchase thanks to our exclusive price protection guarantee. If you can find the same new vehicle for less within five days, Norm Reeves will pay you the difference or buy your vehicle back. It's that simple. Take a test drive today at the Norm Reeves Superstore location closest to you, like the number one Honda retail dealer in the world in the Cerritos Auto Square. Or shop online anytime at normreeves.com. As for Global Honda, new vehicle retail sales 2022. And the, the title is powerful unto itself. We're not supposed to judge books by their cover, but I think that's number. A woman's life is a human life. You know, mm-hmm. you know I think we mean to em- emphasize the is because our enemies seem to think that the only life is within the womb, within the woman. But the woman's life doesn't matter. That, that's really the crux to the matter. And, and we're going backwards, aren't we? Yeah, I'm afraid we are. So the title is is from a slogan from this period. It was from the early 80s under the Reagan administration. And that was the first time that um, conservative Catholics and conservative evangelical Protestants kind of joined together. And they they were putting on the floor of the Congress what they called a human life amendment, right? Um, and it was the human life amendment cut out the pregnant person that was not considered a human life. The only human life they cared about was the life of the embryo or the fetus that that pregnant person was carrying. So what the activists I write about wanted to insist on is exactly what you said, that also the woman's life, uh, these days we would say something more, you know, non-gender specific, the pregnant person or the person who can get pregnant, right? that that person's life is also a human life. It's a human life. And I'm afraid that we're at a stage now where, you know, in the 1980s, okay, they tried with that human life amendment. They didn't really get very far. Uh, even Ronald Reagan was a little funny, you know, a little a little uh, squeamish about pushing that human life amendment. But today, in 2023, with this energized, hyper-conservative Republican wing that's very active and in Congress now, like, they might get that much further. They're certainly going to insist on it and try and move um, something like uh, a fetal rights or or embryonic life um, amendment. They're going to try it in the Supreme Court. They're going to try it in Congress. And it, it's very concerning. What do you think your mom would say about the, the Dobbs decision? Oh, I think she would be just brutally, brutally disappointed. She'd probably, um, probably back out on the street, wouldn't she? She'd be back out. She would definitely be back out on the street. She'd be one of, you know, she'd be one of the uh, old ladies at the demonstration. Um, but I think she would also say something else, which is that if they had stuck with her original proposal, which was just take it out of the law books entirely and just let people make their own choices, you know, which, is, which was a more bold, more progressive approach than Roe versus Wade. Right. I think she would say that they would have had a better chance of holding on to it. You know, it's simpler. It's easier to understand. And she always believed that, you know, even though they weren't they weren't ever going to persuade the Catholic Church and, you know, certainly, you know, some some Protestant churches, too. um, But that but that at the popular level, right, that there would be a lot of ordinary Catholics and a lot of ordinary Protestants who would go along with that, you know, better, better to just take it out of the government's hands and let people make their own choices. And then people could talk to their own clergy. They could talk to their own doctors. They could talk to their own family members. Right. And, 
and make it their choice. And if you don't want to have an abortion, don't have one. Um, so I think my mom would say that there was a missed opportunity, even back in the day, right, that it could have been simpler and it could have been more popular. And maybe they would have won more and lost less. Um, I'm sure your students enjoy hearing your stories about your mom in the classroom. I think so. I think so. It, um, I, I teach the history of feminism all the time, and I also teach the history of law. And um, I think sometimes it's hard for young people today. Um, they, they don't know what kind of a future they're going to have. So I like to tell these stories because to me, the story, the punchline is that when you really try and when you have great allies, you work with other people, even people who are quite different from you, that you win. When it is possible to win. But I think for, you know, for, for the younger generation, you know, if they, if they were around, if they were politically conscious in 2008 or 2012, they saw Obama's victory and they were so inspired by that and Obama's reelection. And they really believed that the country was moving in the right direction. And then the last six or seven years, right, have been kind of a, kind of a devastating whirlwind. For them, right? Um, especially, especially my students who think of themselves as as feminist, as queer, as trans. You know, they don't really know what's going to happen in the future. So I do just want to, I want to remind them, and I want this book to serve as a reminder that you know, when folks really leave it all on the field, whether that was in the movement to decriminalize abortion or, or the movement to control sterilization abuse, right? They won like crazy, and they won. They won overwhelming victories and they won them pretty darn fast in historical time. You know, in less than a decade, they went from thinking, oh, we're never going to win this to having really substantial victories. And I think we can do that today. Yeah. And, and I think what they also did, the other example is, is that they were tireless. They practiced eternal vigilance. That's right. Kind of like our enemies did. You talked about what your mom and others were able to do in a decade. Our enemies, they never gave, they spent 50 years. That's right. So, you know, I think there's a lesson in that for our side. They never gave up. We can never get comfortable. We must be eternally vigilant on this. Mustn't be. Absolutely. We must be eternally vigilant. And I think the, the other thing about people who are, who are against reproductive rights and against um against abortion access for for ordinary folks they you know as much as i opposed and i opposed their politics i think they were inspired by a vision a vision of the future a vision of the kind of world that they wanted to create and i think we have to keep that in mind too um and that may be something that uh, that the pro choice side lost sight of right they were so Fixed. The movement was so fixed on preserving Roe versus Wade and saving what what we could of of abortion rights and abortion access. But I think sometimes we lost the larger vision, and that I think that's where Helen Rodriguez Trias, my neighbor, comes in. You know, she was somebody who started out fighting this very particular issue of sterilization abuse that was happening to uh, Latinas and Black women and poor women and single women and Native American women, disabled women, primarily. And from there, she really developed a, a vision of the world. What would it mean if all people had genuine reproductive freedom? You know, what, what would we have to create? What kinds of policies, policies would we have to have so that everyone could really exercise those choices in a complete way? And we could, we could have a kind of, you know, loving, respectful society that treated people with true dignity, right? So I think we, we also should be informed by that today and going forward. What's the world we want to make, right? How do we want people to be able to create their families and choose? You know, one of the things about, about not allowing people to choose um, abortion and contraception and so on is that it also, it drives all kinds of other decisions. It makes people stay in abusive relationships. Is that a world we want to create? You know, if, you're, if you have a kid when you don't want to have a kid and your partner's not a good partner, then it gets harder and harder to leave. Like, what, what, you know, what are we doing if we're saying to people, 
you know, you don't have that freedom. Um, so I think that that's, that's the way we need to open our minds today and keep, keep opening them, right? As we fight on in the years that come. I like the way you put that rather than you, you're right. We've been playing a lot of defense. That's right. But having vision is playing offense. Uh, on this, and we've just been in defensive posture. Oh, they're going to strike down row. They're going to strike down row. They're going to strike down row, um, and and that's been pretty much it. So I, I think that's a that's a point, um, well taken. Um, we widen, you know, the more we talk about that, we widen the umbrella. We we invite people in. Come join us. You know, be part of this world we want to create. Well, now is definitely the time facing everything we've been facing and the setbacks we have endured. Folks, uh, we invite you to check out the book, uh, A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. A Woman's Life is a Human Life, My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. I want to thank my guest, Felicia Cornblue, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful story. Um, about her mom. Wait, let me ask you this. Did you, were you always aware of your mom's importance in that struggle? Did you know that, uh, understand that from a very young age? I didn't. I knew that my mother was, was passionate about this issue. But um, it was only after my mother had a stroke. Um, she actually had a stroke during my nephew's or mitzvah service. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, the way these things work, um, there's always, there's a Friday night, um, which sort of is the startup service. And then Saturday morning is when the real bar mitzvah happened. And during the Friday night service, my mother had a stroke and the following morning, the whole family was back together again, you know, for my, for the second part of the, um, the ceremony and my nephew was up there doing his thing. And um, my sister asked my father, I think because she was just thinking about my mom and her legacy, because we kind of knew by that point that, that she wasn't ever going to come back. My sister asked my dad, what was the organization that mom was part of, you know, the one that legalized abortion in New York State? And my sister said it as though we all knew. So this was kind of the family lore that it put down to us. But I'm a professional historian, a women's historian, and a historian of law and movements for social change. I didn't know that story. So that was really what got me going and started me on six years of doing research and, and writing about this issue. It's fascinating and unfortunate the way those things happen, because when we're close to it and our family members, they don't always talk about those things and we have to stumble upon them. Anecdotally, I always knew that my mother's father, my grandfather, had founded one of the early black teachers unions in the segregated South. Mm -hmm. uh, and I spoke to the AFLC, I hope for MLK Day. And I knew the story, I just kind of, been, and he, you know, we didn't talk about it before he passed, but others and his peers had told me about it. So I thought I'd Google it, just to see if there was anything out there on it. I, I assumed that there wouldn't be because it was in the 40s. Sure enough, there was. Mm -hmm. And there were photographs of my grandfather sitting down with all of the black education leaders across the state of Tennessee forming this unified black teachers union. A big picture of him, he's standing in the middle. And it just some inspired me to do so. I know how you feel, because you know, we don't talk about it sometimes in families, because we are, you know, families always doing so many other things and we don't always brag about ourselves in family. So I, I had a very similar experience just literally <laughs> this past weekend. And uh, uh, so I, I can relate and thank goodness uh, you were able to find out and, and document and share. It's a, a very, very important story and something for you to be proud of. And I'm proud too. Yeah, you should be. Um, and one of the punchlines of the book, I think, is talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, you know, ask them the questions when you still can. Yeah. yeah. What did you do? How did you do it? When were you doing it? Don't, right. don't take any of that for, for granted. And, and because uh, Felicia did, uh, Professor Cornblue did, folks, we have this story. And I, I, I think it is a lesson in terms of, of what we must do uh, and what we must continue to do and how we need to pick up uh, in this next generation, not be discouraged, not be 
loss not be set back, but to keep on pressing forward because Lord knows uh, her mom and her neighbor and others had their own setbacks and it was probably a lot tougher back then. They don't, they didn't have the resources we have now. That's right. So strongly encourage um, as we reinvigorate and get back out here uh, and renew this fight and continue to fight to win women's true and sustain women's reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Women's reproductive rights, reproductive justice folks are also men's rights as well. We must not see the two as separate. Amen. Felicia Cornblue has been our guest. We strongly encourage you to check out the book, uh, uh, A Woman's Life is a Human Life. My Mother, Our Neighbor, and the Journey from Reproductive Rights to Reproductive Justice. Congratulations, uh, Professor, and thank you. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm sure your students are very uh, glad to be at your feet and studying under your words. I will have to ask them, but thank you for your time. And thank you for your <laughs> You, you grade hard. Is that why you told me? It's always, you must be a tough grader then, huh? I'm not, I'm not going to tell. <laughs> no, no comment, huh? Uh, Thank you, Professor. Thank you.